Well, hi, and welcome back to uh, this second part in my series, God's Plan for Salvation. And I'd just like to quickly recap on what happened in the last, and what I spoke about in the last video. And um, in that video, I explained to you why I was making the series. Because I was seeing dire ignorance amongst the saints of God regarding biblical doctrine. Now, one of the things that I expounded on pretty heavily was the absolute sovereignty of God. Now, I've discovered that if uh, you do not embrace this, you will fall prey to all kinds of deceptions. You become like a man or a woman, tossed by every wind of doctrine and unstable in all your ways. And you see, when you're denying the absolute sovereignty of God, you will rob God, by some way or other, of His omniscience, His omnipresence, and His omnipotence. You will do all of this, all the way through the false doctrine you teach, and you will be forced to ignore myriad passages and verses in God's Word. And I've seen this, in some cases you will even deny whole books of the Bible. You will change the meaning of key words and you will start to eisegete rather than to exegete the Word of God. And this is what happens to you when you do not embrace totally the absolute sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. You need to understand that He is absolutely sovereign. Now, not embracing this important attribute of God will cause you to fall prey to all of this and more and you will not be able to answer questions of your listeners and you will find yourself unable to refute the theology of others. Should you believe it's errant, you'll find you cannot do it. You cannot refute the theology of others using scripture. You can't do it. I've seen this time and time again, okay? You will become ineffective in all doctrine except in the small, errant, watered-down theology of your own teachings. That's what will happen to you. Okay. Then secondly, we touched on the basic doctrines of God. We touched on um, what the Trinity was. We touched on, uh, we expounded, should I say, on the fact that um, Using the scriptures, we saw that God was one being, three distinct persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We also discovered that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work together in our salvation, the Father electing, the Son saving, and the Holy Spirit being active today in our sanctification. We also touched on the doctrines of salvation called soteriology, and I explained to you what that was about. We uh, expounded a bit on the saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as set forth succinctly in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. And we'll go over that a little bit again today. And finally, I presented to you the new birth, by which Jesus said in John 3, 3, that we cannot see the kingdom of heaven without it. And I showed you using Pauline doctrine in Titus 3, 1 to 5, I showed you that the, how the Holy Spirit, the sent comforter, affects this within the hearts of the chosen of God. Okay, so now what we'll do is we're going to continue with uh, this plan that God has set forth in His words to save His chosen, to save the human soul. So if the Bible is saying that we need to be born again which by the way was first spoken of by Jesus way back in the Gospel of John now what did Jesus say see there was this um, Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus who went to Jesus and he said to him at night you see he was too scared to go during the day because you know the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus so he went at night and he said to the Lord Jesus, he said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher sent by God. Because nobody could do the things you do unless God were with him. 
And Jesus just very clear, plainly said to him, I'll tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of heaven unless he is born again. And um, Nicodemus, being nonplussed and perplexed, started to question Jesus. He didn't just uh, stand there and say, okay, well, all right, I spoke, well, no, no. He questioned the Lord Jesus and he said, well, how, how, how? does that happen can we climb back into our mother's wombs and be, is there some mystery here and the Lord Jesus Christ started to talk about a wind and he said um, the wind blows you don't know where it is going to and you don't know where it is coming from he said and you're a teacher of Israel and you don't know this thing you see because the Bible has spoken of this wind on many occasions and the wind is referred to as the Holy Spirit. So um, what is this new birth, uh, you know, what is this wind, uh, you know, let's find out a little bit more about this wind. Now if you could remember when Jesus had completed his work on the cross and after he had ascended into heaven, or should I say just before he ascended into heaven, he told his disciples to go into Jerusalem and wait in the upper room. He said because he needs to go away, because if he doesn't go away, the Comforter won't come. He needed to go away because his work on the earth was finished and um, so that he could send the Comforter. And he said to them, I go and I prepare a place for you in heaven, but I will send the Comforter. So after he had ascended, witnessed by five, over 500 people. Um, the disciples went back to Jerusalem and they waited. And 40 days later, what did they hear? A great rushing wind came and flames, little tongues of fire appeared and seemed to alight on each one of them. But it's the wind that we need to take note of here because um, it was the Holy Spirit that was the comforter that was coming, came like a wind and entered into that upper room and filled them all with the Holy Spirit. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they started to speak in strange tongues. Now these tongues were not uh, gibberish, the rubbish we hear in the churches today. These were languages. And Peter and the rest of the disciples went out immediately and they started to proclaim the gospel. And um, thousands were added to their numbers by that gospel. And the people were amazed because they could understand those words and they could understand the gospel. Now, how do they understand the gospel? Because you see, the Bible tells us that the word of God is veiled to us. It, it's veiled. We, we can't understand it. So how did... How did they suddenly get to understand what Peter was preaching that day? How, how did that happen? Because if the gospel is veiled to them that are perishing, how, how did that happen? How did they come to understand it? Well, you see, the Holy Spirit came and quickened them to life. Now, why was that necessary? Why was it necessary to quicken the people to life in order to enable them to understand that gospel? Well, you're going to struggle on these issues, all of them, if you don't have your doctrines, you know, in a, in a row. You need to understand your doctrines, doctrines of grace. And... Um, you, uh, don't understand these doctrines you will never know never understand God's plan for salvation so why do we have to be quickened to life as the Bible says in, in the, you know as it says so in the Bible do you think that we are just uh, bad people that need to be saved you know like we're kind of wretches you know unworthy perhaps garbage as I've heard some people call God's people, you know, the creation of God, garbage. Is that what you think? Well, 
I wouldn't use the word garbage myself, but I certainly would use the word wretches and uh, unworthy. Uh, the Bible actually goes a, a lot further. It, we are worse than we are worse than wretches and worse than bad. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 that we are dead in our sins. Dead in trespasses and sins. Stone dead. And that is why we can't understand the gospel. It is veiled. Veiled dead people can't get up. They need to be quickened to life and that's what the new birth is all about. That's what the new birth is all about. That is what I read to you a little bit earlier on where it said that we are washed by the renewal of the, uh, the, the washing of the regeneration and the renewal of the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit comes along and quickens us, brings us to life. And then what? What, what happens after that? Well, then we, now we can go to the Gospel. Now, the gospel is given to us in many places in the Bible, but I'm going to use the popular one. Um, in 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, because I hear many people preach this gospel, and it is the gospel. And it's just succinctly put, it says, uh, Paul says uh, this. He says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you and which you received and in which you stand and by which you are being saved. Okay, I want to stop there for a little bit because this is what the ESV says. It says being saved. Other Bibles say by which you are saved and they are quite correct. You are saved once and for all by this gospel that I'm going to continue reading to you now. But it's not wrong say what the ESV is saying here when it says uh, being saved present continuous tense because there is never a moment in the child of God's life when he is not being saved by the gospel and he will continue to be saved by that gospel until from the time should I say that he is regenerated and he's enabled to believe right up until he goes to glory. That gospel will be saving that person. The saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with this interpretation which says, being saved. Nothing in my hands I bring, only to the cross I cling. All through your walk, as we walk through this veil of the shadow of death. Okay? Okay, so it says, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Okay, for I delivered to you as of first importance, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day, what, in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, who was Peter, and then to the twelve. And then a little bit further on it says, and last of all, to me, as one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So that is the gospel. You cannot believe that gospel unless you are enabled to believe it. You cannot believe it in your dead state. It is veiled to those who are not predestined and chosen to believe it. It is only available to be believed by the chosen of Christ. Those whom he foreknew without merit. Those who have ears to hear.